Mm, yeah. I love my HBCU. Uh, and boy, boy, I love it, love it. Yeah. I love it, love it. Yeah, I love my HBCU. Yeah. And man, yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Mm, yeah. Man. I hope my team they won one. Won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. yeah. I tune into the HCCU Sports Lab to see if my team wanna lose. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, keep tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Kavir, you know what he be talking about. Talking about control. They know what they be talking about. Talking about. They compress the analytic data with the hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna lose, yeah. And who the ball? Who the ball? So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes, sir. and pay attention, Boy. cause he gonna teach a lesson. Yes. Welcome to episode 156 of Inside the HBC Sports Lab radio show and podcast. The show that's covering the sporting HBC diet. All things HBC sports from institutions large and small, from NAIA to the NCAA, we share insights on information on the HBC sports culture and HBC athletic aesthetics. To facilitate the story of HBCU athletic programs in the business of HBCU sports, I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, with my co hosts, Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. We are filming from our home studio and sending a signal live to you in the beautiful home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. Today's episode of Inside the HBCU Sports Lab is sponsored by THD Agency. THD Agency is a company that provides sporting and educational consulting and data analytics. Today's show will be a good one, as we'll discuss the latest HBCU news, as well as the SWAC 2021 Football Media Day this Tuesday. And we'll have as our guest, Dr. Jason Cable, Associate SWAC Commissioner. Hope you enjoy our news as we move forward. I'm doing just fine, uh, Dr. Bill. Getting ready to get myself mentally uh, and even physically for that nature, ready for the upcoming college football season. Can't wait. Uh, been missing football in its normal uh, uh, entirety. So I am very excited to see some of the personalities come out, start to speak up, uh, to hear about the stuff coming out of the two a days. So great weekend. I don't get as much golf in as my, my comrade CB there, but I, I do get a few swings in every now and then. <clears throat> so now just gearing up for this 2021 year, our Lord football season. Oh my goodness. So they let you get a couple of swings in, Mike. I oh. just did not know about all that. Yeah. You'd be amazed. You'd be amazed. I mean, I'm <laughs> my short game is good. <laughs> <laughs> if I can just <laughs> I like <laughs> if the if I can just stop the slicing, I'd be all right. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> hey. Charles, can you give him some pointers on that, or is there anything you can do about the slicing? Oh yeah, game? Oh, yeah. oh yeah, definitely. I can, I can, I can uh, uh, put some pointers on that for Mike because um, uh, that was one of my deals too in terms of stopping the slice. And and now, ooh, Mike, you talk about short game. I'm yeah. ready. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. I, I just, I just want to, I want an anti-correcting golf shaft. What is it? The, the R12. From, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have to worry about my stance and my swing. It just automatically corrects your swing. I know, man. I want whatever it takes just to swing straight. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but let me show love to some of those listeners out there that jumped in here. Uh, we switched over quickly, so we'll bring them back in there and get into in, into the look here but with that being said let's get into a little bit about uh Birmingham and the trip um uh, both of y'all are planning to be there Monday evenings so what are your expectations before the big day on Tuesday coming in at, on Monday what are your thoughts about that well it's always a fun time in terms of uh seeing all our colleagues uh coming in for uh media day uh, a lot of people who we uh follow and listen to and things of that nature and to kind of uh, share uh, notes and ideas and things of that nature in regards to the upcoming season. Uh, and it re really goes towards uh, helping uh, give all our, our SWAC fan base uh, a, a behind the scenes perspective. So looking forward to uh, really seeing all of our colleagues and, and getting as many tidbits as we can from SWAC Media Day. And hopefully we can provide uh, as much coverage uh, as our SWAC fan base, our passionate SWAC fan base uh, can get with regards to uh, uh, this upcoming fall 21 season, because I think a lot of people are really uh, looking forward to this new look Southwestern Athletic Conference. 
No doubt about it. Mike, what about your thoughts when you come in Monday night? What jumps into your mind? Oh, uh, I think CB hit it on the nail. I think there's a lot of excitement with seeing some of our compadres in the media. Uh, we haven't seen each other for quite some time. We've we've talked, you know, over the internet, and we've talked, you know, like we're doing now. But it's nothing like seeing those folks sharing those stories off camera um, about the the excitement and the buildup about the Inca, the SWAC season in 2021. Um, you look forward to seeing some of those players come in. You know, we've got some players that we didn't see, you know, Felix Harper or, or other folks that we didn't see them. <laughs> so have we forgotten about them? So and then who, you know, who, you know, who, who, who are we excited about with FAMU and Bethune? And, and it's it just spurs a lot of interesting conversation. So I'm looking forward to that aspect as well as who do we look out for? Who are going to be the personalities? That's something that we joke, but we jostle quite a bit in the media. So I'm looking forward to just those discussions and the energy and the buildup. Well, the sweat put in a optional, and yes, I'm a little muffled here, but this is for all purposes, about mass as optional. What are your thoughts on this component of it? Are, are you thinking that's a solid move or is that a different direction what are your thoughts on that in terms of what's going on as a lot of us seem to be moving um past COVID-19 although you got the Delta variant and you have some populations that haven't done really well particularly in the south you know there are five states who can't leave out uh west when you talk about California Texas Florida uh three of the five and obviously Mississippi and those are all now SWAC territories when you go from Florida to Texas what are your thoughts about the mass policy that the SWAC put in place? Starting with you, Mike, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think it's the right conservative approach. I, I, you said it yourself. We still have the Delta and the Lambda uh, variant hanging out there. Um, you see that the airline industry has not backed off of their policy or their requirement to wear masks. And there are a lot of other agencies and institutions that still say, hey, if you haven't been vaccinated, you have to wear a mask. So a lot of companies, institutions, organizations are taking a slower, methodical more conservative approach because we haven't clearly really gotten out of this thing just yet. We've made progress, but there's still those variants that are hanging out there. And I think it, you know, it's prudent, it's good management, it's good judgment to say, Hey, here, here's an optional layer of protection that we put in place. It's nothing different than other organizations that have critical mass have, have essential employees are doing. So I applaud it. Charles, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I saw some information out there. Like you said, the Delta, the Lambda, somebody said we're going to be all the way in Epsilon, Gamma. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, mean, I, I mean, I definitely think uh, Mike hit the nail on the head in terms of uh, we're not out the woods yet. Uh, and we're starting to see, uh, especially with this Delta variant, uh, that uh, now more than ever, you, you still need to continue uh, that conservative and methodical approach. So uh, to have the option uh, for the mask, even for those of us who are vaccinated, uh, it's still something that I consider uh, prudent. Uh, I know I have not gotten rid of any of the plethora of masks that I have around here, especially uh, when traveling. So, uh, you know, however we can uh, do our parts uh, to slow this thing down and to uh, get back to some semblance of what we used to know as normalcy. So uh, whatever it takes. So I, I really appreciate uh, the Southwestern Athletic Conference taking this uh, conservative methodical approach uh, in terms of uh, where we are. We're going to be in uh, another one of those hotspots. I think, Dr. Bill, you mentioned uh, the states, and we're within that geographic footprint of of the hotspots of where that Delta variant is continuing uh, to uh, take take a toll on its citizens. So looking forward to, you know, whatever it is we need to do in terms of uh, uh, staying safe. No doubt about it. Uh, shout out to Reggie Walston as he uh, comes in here and say, can't wait to the MEAC media day, July 30th. Uh, we've signed up to be on it virtual. Um, so one of us, if not all of us, will be in the mix for that. But as we talk about finishing up, uh, check that out. Charles, look what you want. Ah. I like that. Oh, I like and that. so um, I'll let it out the bag now. Throughout the season, I have gotten a mask for each of the 12 black members. Those, I would have done more, 
for the other conferences, but these are the only ones that they had licensed and had it done, had the um, ability to get them done. So throughout the season, obviously, I will have the matchup. And since this is the first one off the board, you'll see me doing a mask, <laughs> supporting people and asking people to wear their masks. And then I'll ask you all to select which mask I'm going to wear uh, as we do a pick them. Ah. We'll do ah. the pick them based on the math. So we'll be able to do any of the intersectional, sectional games between the divisions, intradivisional games. Uh, matchups uh, for the SWAT game of the week. I think there's only one week this week, this year, in mm -hmm. terms of the uh, weekly contest where a SWAT, SWAT conference matchup does not exist. So we'll so figure Dr. out. Bill, um, so when, whenever Jackson State's mass uh, comes up, can I make my selection now? <laughs> <laughs> Man. Man, that's Did bold. Be like that? See, that's just bold. That's just bold. <laughs> So I was like, oh, man, it's going to be like that. He can't even. Man. Can't even before he starts showing the love. Wow. It's like, it's like that. <laughs> wow. Well, let's check this out. Uh, on Last week, uh, Andrew Roberts, the assistant commissioner of media relations, put out one of the last updates with the media day attendees, specifically uh, talking about the player student college athletes that would be in attendance. Obviously, things kick off at 10 o'clock uh, with Tiffany Green, Jay Walker, as they uh, will be doing the broadcast team that will go straight streaming to the uh, SWAC, I mean, to ESPN3 online, the streaming part of it. But Alabama A&M, Kill Glass, Abdul Fatih Ibram, Alabama State, Ezra Gray, and Colton Adams, Alcorn State, Felix Harper, and Torrance Wilson, Bethune-Cookman, Ontario Johnson and Taron Mallard. Florida AM will be Keenum Forbes and Marquise Bell. Grandma State, Dan Fields and DJ Clark. Jackson State, Shador Sanders and Niles Gaddy. Mississippi Valley, Khalid Johnson and Jerry Garner. Prairie View AM, Drake Cheatham and Jason Dumas. Southern State, Tyree Carter and Jalen Ivey. Texas Southern, Jonathan Giles and Michael Bedejo. So, man, with the players, anybody on your list that are much talked to uh, from your list? Starting with you, Mike. Yeah, so um, I got a, I got a few. I, 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 mentioned, I mentioned Felix Harper. You know, we didn't have a chance to see him for a while. I'd like to see him. Of course, everybody wants to see Shador at uh, Jackson State. Um, but I also – Want to represent Prairie View and uh, Jason Cheatham as well. See what that young man, 5'10", uh, all speed, all all agility. Um, I'm also like to I'd like to uh, speak with Ezra Gray, the two-time All-American as well, uh, academic All-American. Congratulations to him. So those are the three or four that kind of stand at the top of my list. Of course, Akil Glass. Um, what everybody, there's a lot of excitement about him coming into the fall. Um, and all of his accolades and honors from this past spring. I uh, want to get his take on, you know, what his thoughts are coming in to the spring. I think to a certain degree, it may have been undervalued and underrated, even with all of his accolades and abilities. So I don't want to get wordy, but there's about four or five that are kind of at the top of my list that I've kind of starred up. No doubt about it. That sounds fascinating. Let me shift to you, Charles, before we go into this break quickly. Anybody um, – you talk to the Jackson State people regularly. So outside of that, anybody that you're interested in and uh, in getting your mic in front of and getting their thoughts from a college athlete's perspective? Oh, no doubt about it. But I think Florida A&M and Bethune Cookman's athletes, uh, especially a uh, young man like Marquise Bell of Florida A&M, uh, uh, athlon preseason All-American, and he's one of the most talked about uh, safeties uh, in FCS football uh, coming into this conference. So definitely uh, getting his thoughts with, with regards to Florida a &M coming in. Uh, and also uh, Bethune Cook, uh, when you take a look at Ontario Johnson, Tom Mallard, uh, both of those guys. So just kind of getting their uh, thoughts with regards to the style of ball that both uh, teams are going to bring to the SWAC. And, and the style of play and what they've seen thus far, their familiarity with the SWAC. So really looking forward to uh, getting the thoughts from uh, everybody, of course, on the SWAC east side of the ledger, uh, but definitely uh, Florida a and Bethune-Cookman with the excitement with them coming in 
uh, definitely want to get their thoughts. No doubt about it, Charles. I like the way you really make sure that you lean towards that Eastern Division. I think you uh, reconfigured where you see the strength of the conference in so many different ways. That focus point, I can see why. I can see why. So it's a great point that you make there in terms of the East. That gives us a chance, Mike, to, to shine and lean over here to the West. So we'll both get a <laughs> great perspective of splitting out the conference and the divisions and get all the lab lecture listeners what they need to know uh, inside and out. With that, let's take our first break. This is Dr. Bill inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. After the break, we'll be back with none other than Dr. Jason Cable of the SWAC. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this break. For 200 years, Montgomery, Alabama has been making history by people who had the courage to stand up for change. Today, this riverfront city has been reborn, embracing the past and looking forward to the future. From the National Memorial for Peace and Justice to the stage of the Alabama Shakespeare Festival, this is where history was and is made. We are proud to call Montgomery home, and together, we can be the change. This is Carlos Brown, letting you know that we're on the move. You can now catch the Carlos Brown Show beginning this July on the Black College Sports Network each and every Saturday from 11 to 1 Eastern Time. That's 10 to 12 Central Time. Same time, new place. On Facebook at the Carlos Brown Show and Black College Sports Network. Online at www.mybcsn.net. And on the BCSN app, available on Google Play and the Apple App Store. Sugar Chateau Desserts is a specialty bakery located in the Charlotte, North Carolina metro area. We will create delicious and one-of-a-kind treats for any occasion. Sugar Chateau is currently shipping cakes in a jar, offering a variety of different flavors in a single serve container that can help you celebrate in accordance with social distancing. Place your orders today by calling 803-526-7895 or visiting SugarChateauDesserts.com. We represent that swag, that meag, and let me say, say, what's up to Tennessee, stay, stay, and tune into the HBC Sports Lab with Dr. Bill, Bill, Mike, and Charles. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're back at it. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Watch and Charles Bishop. You see us having some fun in the background. We love what we do, and we have one of the best at it, Dr. Jason Cable, coming in from the SWAC office. Uh, associate commissioner for all things it seems in so many different ways let's just jump back in here everybody knows you on this side uh, Dr. Cable many of us are excited about the 2021 SWAC football media day uh, but with that said the last email from Andrew Roberts talked about the mass uh, preferential that media folks bring in the mass I really thought that was an important note the SWAC has always seen since the beginning of this to side on the side of caution, if you allow me to use that framework. I thought that was important that you all put that into play. Uh, we were doing our little things, talking about the masks and supporting that. Um, obviously with the Delta variant, now the Lambda. I mean, it sounds like we're gonna have a Greek alphabet if we're not careful here with folks choosing not to get the vaccination for whatever reason, we won't get into that, even though we certainly encourage folks to do uh, what's safe um, for uh, the world at this point. But what's your thoughts? What are your thoughts in terms of us, the SWAC moving in that direction, I should say? I think, it's especially for the event as a baseline, we encourage masking. Uh, but as we head towards fall sports, we strongly encourage vaccination. And so we've been checking in with our member institutions and we're, we're trending in the right direction. Um, if individuals uh, don't choose to get vaccinated, then obviously we have to have a testing protocol um, in place. And so we're not there yet. Uh, the NCAA released their summer uh, COVID-19 recommendations at the beginning of the month. And so they should be releasing the fall recommendations over the next couple of weeks. And so we've always aligned our protocol and procedures with the NCAA uh, recommendations. And so once those recommendations are released and once we uh, survey the schools again to see how many student athletes, coaches, trainers, tier one individuals are vaccinated, then we'll move forward with our plan. Man, we really appreciate you sharing that information, giving us that insight. I think it 
will rebrand the conference in terms of the earnest of individuals still understanding the magnitude of COVID-19 and how we need to proceed going forward if we're gonna to get to really celebrate uh, the SWAC in 2021, it's various different capacities. So I thought it was important to get you to share that and I re really appreciate you jumping off like that. Let's spin it into more of the energy associated with the event. Um, if you let me to take two steps back, you were with Charles and a couple of the other SWAC uh, administration leaders went down to FAMU a couple of weeks ago, that July 1st, uh, when they were going all out in terms of joining the SWAC. Tell us a little bit about that experience for those that may have saw the media part of it in regards to that, but the backside of that. What did that experience feel like? Can you give us any information on what that looks like? Well, the atmosphere was electric. Um, they are all in uh, the SWAC from an institutional perspective, from a community perspective, from an alumni and fan perspective, you could just feel it. You know, all those groups were on campus to welcome the commissioner um, to Tallahassee. A series of events, uh, we've met with uh, uh, city commissioners, uh, their fundraising on both institu institutional and ex external to the institution, their booster clubs as well. And so it was a lot of uh, smack talking, if you will, in terms of... <laughs> <laughs> what they intend to do their first couple of years in the conference. You know, we're not biased. Look, we want everybody to win, right? But there's, there's a strong sentiment there um, that, that they're going to come in the conference and do well. And so we want everyone to do well, obviously, from, from a SWAC perspective. But, you know, it was just amazing how all groups embrace uh, the conference and they, they just had nothing but positive things to say about it. They were really excited about rekindling uh, some robberies, you know, some games they used to play years and years ago. A lot of those alums are still with us and remember uh, some of those contests. So they're excited to get back to Alabama A&M, to, to Alabama State, um, Jackson State, you know, on a consistent basis. Those are just some that they mentioned. Um, but it, all in all, you know, you, we couldn't ask for, you know, a better reception. No doubt about it. Uh, that reminds me, I, I gave a historical a speech, if you would, yesterday at a Hall of Fame banquet, the Prairie View Interscholastic League Coaches Association dedicated to those segregated high schools pre-1970, if you would. And one of the things I got to talk about is the collective memory. So the fact that you talked about that memory of FAMU and their previous rivals, uh, a lot of it was part of the SIC. And then they have some significant rivals with other SWAT schools in terms of those championship level uh, teams um, also. So that is fascinating that you bring that up. And I think it's so important to talk about that collective memory. With that, let me pass the mic. Uh, let me go to you, Charles, in regards mm -hmm. to the question that you want to ask. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Cable, I wanted to uh, ask the question. Uh, a lot of fans have uh, said how excited they are uh, coming into this uh, fall 21 season, especially uh, sort of uh, in a – uh, post-pandemic framework, uh, if you will, after not having football in the fall last year. But uh, for, from a conference office perspective, uh, how excited are, are you about uh, the SWAC fan base uh, really getting the opportunity to see their teams again and, and really uh, getting behind this fall football season, especially with Florida A&M and Bethune Cookman coming in as well? I think we're equally as excited as our fan base. I mean, there's been just a high level of anticipation with Bethune Cookman and Fam, you come into the conference, but not only that, you just mentioned it's it's basically been a football drought for our fans in terms of being able to show up and participate in the experience as they did once before, and we all know it's the experience, right? It's not just the game. You got the bands coming back, you got the opportunity to tailgate coming back, you got stadiums um, allowing uh, full capacity. So all those factors really uh, contribute to the excitement, and we're looking for a record year. No doubt about it. I love that in perfect timing. You, you work in synergy with us so well because our Mr. Tailgate, if you would, is none other than Mike Washington. He actually <laughs> does segment oftentimes during the fall to talk about who's the best in terms of tailgate. So you can throw a little bit of your flavor in, there, flavor in there if you want, Dr. K, but after this question, tell us who you think is some of the hottest out there. 
but he also <laughs> gets in and tells some prep meals that folks can add uh, to their tailgate options wow. of food they own already. So, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Take it in yeah. any doctor you want. <laughs> He's that a little bit out there. I would, I would love to join join all of this banter about who's got the best tailgate, who's got the most unique flavors, who's got the most unique. But I would probably start World War III with all of the excitement and build up going to the swag. I think I said something about low country boils <clears throat> the other day, and I got all kinds of DMs about they don't know about the uh, low country boils on the west side of the swag. Oh, my goodness. I think I started. <laughs> so I'll hold off to uh, – to do some of those shows, but I, I like you look uh, forward to a lot of excitement. Now to my question, with all of this excitement, with, you know, with everything kind of released post seemingly uh, post COVID-19, I know that, you know, you and the staff are very planning and calculated um, with the Delta and Lambda vi uh, variants still kind of looming. Uh, I know that you guys have identified some potential risk and put protocols in place just in case, you know, we have to take a step back, even though we're going where we're bringing the bands where, you know, we're doing we're doing the full tailgate. We're doing a regular attendance. But I know that this staff, uh, yourself included, does a lot of planning. Can you share with us any abnormal or different protocols that you've put in place just in case we see kind of this these variants kind of rearing their ugly heads? Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, what we're doing right now is retrofitting the plan that we had last year. In, you know, in the event that we ramp back up with cases and we need to uh, implement social distancing strategies like we had in place last year, that we need to have an uptick in testing, uh, we're letting the science kind of dictate where we go. And a good tool for us, as I mentioned before, has been the NCAA recommendation. Brian Hayline, who is the chief medical officer, he comes out with a brief every other week. And so we want to align ourselves with the best practice uh, right now, I think we're just in a holding parent pattern, as you mentioned, those variant uh, COVID strands and seeing, you know, how they will impact us moving forward. And so, yes, we have a plan that we can dust off and put into place and we may have to adjust it just based on the climate. Um, but we are uh, planning for, you know, an uptick. And if, if something happens, we're able to, to address. We're very nimble and flexible in that regard. Awesome. Awesome. Thank mm -hmm. you, Jason. Yeah. Last question I have for you um, before we let you go, we extend this segment, if you would, a little bit. Do you get to have any excitement? You know, there's so much excitement out there for so many different people. You spoke about it, fam, you directly. Obviously, you can see it probably in some of our questions and energy that we're providing about next Tuesday. Do you get to enjoy any of that, or is it just strictly work in terms of how you have to focus and making sure this goes off? Do you feel any of that buzz and energy? Oh, absolutely. And I think it, it contributes to the excitement and, and working long hours and, and not it's really not a job. You know, we're in a place now that we're just excited about pushing the swag forward. Uh, Andrew Roberts, uh, Assistant Commissioner for Media Relations, and Adina Pooler, our Social Commissioner for Internal Operations, um, they have done a great job in, in terms of just laying the framework. Uh, and we talk about Media Day, putting it together. You know, it's a lot of things that go into that. I mean, our checklist is probably 200 items deep <laughs> right now, and we're still adding. We have a, a meeting tomorrow at 10 o'clock to make sure that we can just fine-tune everything before everyone arrives. So before the event, you know, it's hectic. Uh, we look to, to benefit from the excitement and experience some of that excitement during the event, but obviously you're working. I think af afterwards, after the event is over, uh, then you can kind of take a deep breath and exhale and uh, just see the few fruits of your labor. Well, Dr. Jason Cable, it is a pleasure, all our pleasure to have you on here for a couple of minutes. I know your Sunday is very busy and trying to give you a chance to get a break. So I appreciate you taking time out of your Sunday. Uh, to give us a little update on what to expect for the SWAT Media Day this Tuesday, uh, kicking off at 10 o'clock, uh, as you said, will be broadcast on ESPN uh, 3 in terms of that framework with uh, Tiffany Green, J. Scott Walker, uh, in terms of bringing it like everybody can't wait to Dr. Charles McCullough's media address. So just want to say thank you. Let's get into this break. Dr. Kenyatta Cavill inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. We'll be right back after this break. Clemson, Paris, and Tampa's my community. I grew up here, went to school here, and my wife and I make our home here. What makes Tampa special are its people. So when I represent someone injured in my community, it's personal. 
call my office and speak to a real lawyer and not some referral service. I will fight the insurance companies to get the settlement that you deserve. At the Law Office of Clinton Paris, we take the pain out of being hurt. This is Brian Fulford. A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCSN Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSN Sports Wrap, YouTube at MyJBN Online, and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network's app. Make sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. We represent that swag, that meag, and let me say, say, what's up the Tennessee State State? You tune into the agency sports lab, which I can feel. This is Dr. Neal inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Hope you enjoyed our interview with Dr. Jason Cable, Associate Commissioner of the SWAC, providing some update just so you can understand what the media folks that will be in there, what we will be dealing with to make sure that you get the latest and greatest information on the SWAC Media Day. With that, let me jump right into it. I'm going to go with you, Mike. So um, this was not on the script, so I'm going to really – Pull your coattail a little bit. Um, let's get into the Western Division. Some time has passed since you gave this out in the spring, the way, way, way too early prediction. So obviously things can change, um, and they can change again as you get more information as we really head into the fall. But let me ask it this way. What do you believe the predicted order of finish will be? For Let's start with the West. So this is what the sports information mm-hmm. and what the coaches that vote on this, what do you think? I want to see how close either one of you are in terms of the predicted order of finish that will come out Monday afternoon or certainly first thing Tuesday morning when they release it to the public. Mike, let me show out and see what your skills are in terms of Las Vegas. What are the odds? What, what do you think? You can start at the bottom with number six. So walk us through it. You got a little time, so take your time. On the western side of things, what is your guess to what will be the predicted order finish? This is not Mike's. This is what <laughs> the conference will release. <laughs> so when you asked me this question earlier, I think I had Southern at number top, at number one. Ooh. I think, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take a step back and look at the framework. Of, look within the framework of the question you asked me. I think there's a, a bit of unknown, but I think they're still on the top of the hill. So I think Alcorn State will uh. be number one. I think because of the way they finished, Southern will be number two. Um, I think Prairie View will be number three. Oh. Uh, no, actually, take that back. I think Pine Bluff will be number three, and then Prairie View will be number four, and then you'll have Grambling uh, still down at the bottom. I think there's some questions oh. that that Vegas will see with Grambling that they haven't asked. So that's kind of my order that I expect to see coming from Vegas. If, you know, you still have Felix Harper. When they when scouts when when the statisticians look out, they look at stability. They look at star power coming. They also look at offensive uh, and defensive players on, on the roster. I think we have yet to be seen. So I I th- I expect to see Alcorn State number one, Southern number two, and uh, then because of the way they perform, young team, new coaching staff, a lot of upswing. I expect to see UAPB in third. Yeah. Wow. This is fascinating. So six is Texas Southern. Yeah, six is, I'm sorry, six is Texas Southern. Five is Grambling State. Four is Prairie View a and Three is Pine Bluff. Two is Southern, and number one is Alcorn, according to, not Mike, but what will be released from the SWAC media day. Charles, sticking with the same thing, this is not Charles Bishop, Top six. We'll get a chance to get into that a little later. We'll tease that um, either today or maybe we might give you a little early pre-show. We'll see what that looks like because we might get the whole team together 
the new BCSN team, which includes now Carlos Brown, Brian, and AD. AD is still out celebrating, but Brian will be in town. And then we also bring in BJ Jones, uh, as we do with the special segment. And we may even have an update news for that. So we'll continue to tease that out. But according to the SIDs and the coaches, Charles sticking with the West as a theme that we're going on from six to one. What order do you believe? Let's check out your Las Vegas skills. Uh, we know uh -huh. you're on the golf course, but what about at the table? Let's see what you got. I think the SIDs, the prognosticators from Vegas, uh, from six to one, I think they'll go Texas Southern at six, at five. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> I think they will uh, go with, and this is difficult for me to do this, but I, I think they'll go Prairie View, five, Grambling, I'm sorry, they'll go Grambling 5, Prairie View 4, UAPB 3, Southern 2, Alcorn 1. So you in the same framework of Mike, you hesitated there, which is nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 hedging, I, I hedging got the 1 bets. and 2. You are yeah. hedging your bets with 4 or 5 on Grambling, I mean with Prairie View and Grambling. So we'll see. Um, now this, this is... And you gave the caveat because this is not what I think. This is what I think. Yeah, we'll get it. Right. Yeah. This is actually this. Let me let me also say this is not what I think. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I think they will think, <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> Y'all making sure I laid that out. I'm good. <laughs> it's taped on here, so we know this is Cavill that put this on the table. <laughs> get the guys, the professors in trouble here. This is a professional framework. We are hedging our bets. You'll get a little tease of this mm -hmm. as we talk about bulls up, bears down. You know, we used to do that segment. We'll start bringing that back to some degree in terms of some college athletes and what that may look like and certainly some coaches and some teams. We'll get to frame that, and we'll even add in a segment. We'll look at overall athletic programs associated with the AD and VP. So teasing that a little bit. So let's flip it. Let's go to the East Division. Yeah. In terms of that. Oh, so yeah. Falls with one and two in terms of all four and southern, uh, respectively, as you drop it down. But that, that's good. That's where we come out here and why we get, uh, quote, unquote, paid the big bucks in terms of delivering for our fans. But let's go to the East Division. Again, this is what the SIDs and coaches will ultimately select in terms of the pre uh, predictive order. That's why we call it predictive. Predictive order of finish. Things will change, no doubt. But Charles, East Division, what do you see on that side? Uh, sure. On the Eastern side, I think they'll go um, uh, starting from the bottom to the top of Valley, Bethune, Cookman, Alabama State, Jackson State, Florida AM, Alabama AM. Interesting. Interesting. Sticking with AM, the spring champions, and traditionally, that has been the direction that you've seen a lot of times in years past that mm. the last champion will be at the top. In some ways, that finishes on both sides with all four getting the slight nod that they wanted back in 2019. Mm -hmm. Spring, which is the fall 20 edition, you have Alabama A&M. So you match on this side. Let's go to Mike and see his thoughts in terms of this predicted order finish again. Make sure that I make that clear and say it several times. From the SIDs. Yeah. <laughs> like the SIDs and coaches. Uh, right. That, do it, that will be released Monday evening or certainly Tuesday morning. Mike, what is that predicted order of finish going to look like? Six to one based on what the SWAC will release. Again, looking at our Las Vegas odds, I want to see how close your gentlemen are in terms of what this looks at when it actually comes out and see if I should have went and played some money based on how y'all think about it. Ah, uh, this is this is a little tougher for me for how I see the SAD. So I from the bottom, I think you'll have Mississippi Valley. Um, I think you'll have um, they will see Alabama State, then Jackson State. No, I'm sorry. Let me go back. Mississippi Valley. 
I think they will look at Bethune as number five. I think they will look at Alabama State as number four. Number three, I think they will look at Jackson State. And I think number two, they will look at Alabama A&M. I, I think number one, they will look at FAM only because this is different. Typically, the, the returning champ, they tend to rank them number one. However, with things different, you have a championship caliber team coming from the MEAC. I think they will look at that a little bit differently and have FAMU at number one and Alabama A&M number two. Let let the mess talking begin. You know, Dr. Cavill, interesting oh. point. Because 2019, I think most Florida A&M uh, fans will tell you they were the Black College National Champs. Right. And we saw them uh, on the field. So uh, that, that would be an interesting thing for the SIDs and coaches to come back and sort of flip FAM and Alabama A&M 1-2 uh, up there. Yeah, 2019 was a fascinating year when you get into the debate of the Black College National Champion. In fact, Roy, um, in terms of BCSN Sports Network, did, in fact, name FAMU the National Black College yep. Champion. Um, I think there was certainly an argument that they could make that. Um, Dr. Cavills had them at number two um, in terms of what took place there. But uh, fascinating, when you go back to 2019, just to go back down memory lane a little bit, our collective memory, as we say, uh, FAMU had some big wins. They had a win over Southern. Yep. One of the top teams in the SWAC actually played for the conference championship. They did lose to uh, Alcorn State that year. Uh, they also defeated North Carolina A&T. It actually represented the MEAC yeah. in terms of the uh, Celebration Bowl. So that was fascinating. They had some other big wins, uh, obviously, that year, too, in terms of South Carolina State, uh, North Carolina Central. They were sliding a bit. Had a tough loss, obviously, to Bethune-Cookman uh, that – put them in an argument that it probably would have been much clearer if they would have got that victory. So great points you make there, Charles. So as I kick it back to you for some uh, further comments, I see you want to jump in here, but I did want to designate to make sure that the same page in terms of you seeing how the SIDs and coaches on the West, you hedge a little bit on a couple of them that you may think may flip a little bit so we can also measure that. But a clear difference in terms of what you see at the top on the East versus one or two. Uh, you flip. Charles had Alabama A and M at one, FAMU at two. Mike flipped it with having uh, uh, FAMU, Florida A and M at one, and Alabama at two. So it'll be interesting to see what that looks like. Essentially, all of y'all see the top four teams uh, looking at Alabama A and M, Florida A and M in terms of East, Alcorn and Southern in terms of the West. And then right under that, you have Pine Bluff and Jackson State. So it'll be interesting to see as we walk through that, what does that look like in terms of that? Obviously, as we get closer to it, we'll give you a chance to talk about how you see the predicted order finish, which is going to be more measured in terms of all the historic frameworks that you all do when you look at your data analytics and those kind of things. Before we get into this break, um, in fact, let's go into the break and we're going to hold your thoughts, Charles, as a tease. This is Dr. Bill inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Watson and Charles Bishop getting into the fourth quarter. This is our last break before we close up on the show today, uh, getting you ready for the SWAC 21 SWAC Football Media Day scheduled for this Tuesday starting at 10 o'clock. Uh, we'll be there with the entire team of the BCSN. Uh, so check us out. You can go to my, BS, my JBN my BCSN to make sure you stay on top of things and all things HBCU sports from our perspective. We can't wait. Stick with us after this last quick break. We'll be right back. It was a, a monumental game for a and and Tampa. It was a monumental game. Somebody had to lose and thank God it was them this time. We knew it was going to be a battle. Look at Jake Avis record. 202 and 36 I think. Some, some un off the wall figures. And nobody would play him because they didn't want to take a chance of getting beat. But the truth of it is, over 46,000 tickets. Blacks were sitting on 
in, in the East stands. The whites were sitting in the West stands, and the score wound up 34-28. Uh, the only thing we proved that uh, we weren't inferior, that we were not inferior, and we were not afraid. For one night, for 160 minutes, we were better than them. Have you had your Earth Blend coffee today? At Earth Blend Coffee, we take pride in offering you the very best of beans across the world, blended and roasted to perfection, giving you superior quality and satisfying and flavorful taste. Experience the world in one cup with Earth Blend Coffee. Are they play, boy? You gonna learn today how you play, they play, they play, they play. How they play, play, yeah. We represent that swag, that me yag. And let me say, say, what's up the Tennessee State State? You tune into the agency Sports Lab. With Dr. But I heard he's not there. This is Dr. Gaville inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. That back discussion on the backside, this is fascinating. What you're hearing, what you're not hearing. We'll see. With that, let me give the mic to Mike uh, for his closing statement as he has an appointment that he has to get to. Mike, what are your thoughts for uh, in the two? Yeah, I gave, I gave, you know, in the context of Dr. Cavill's questions, uh, looks like we got a little static here. But uh, in the context of Dr. Gaville's questions, I gave what I thought the SADs. I think the unwritten are, number one, how good is Felix Harper still, um, which affects my personal, uh, my personal, I guess, thoughts. The other thing is, <clears throat> while, <clears throat> while Prairie View has lost a couple of key players on the defensive side, they now have a quarterback transfer from Louisville. So personally, I think Prairie View – may perform a little better than that if they could backfill some of the quarterback positions as well. I also think that, you know, I think we were talking in the background, FAMU has a lot of transfers, um, not just the one from Kansas State, um, that, you know, may may factor into that decision. So I think when it's all said and done, uh, I actually kind of rank personally per view a little bit higher than what I think the SIDs will see them. And – and on the flip side, I don't think we know what Bethune can bring to the table. I think we're looking at past precedents, past performance. I think they may rank a little bit higher and surprise a few folks as well. So it, it remains to be seen. I'm very excited about this. Unfortunately, I have to go to another appointment, but I want to thank Dr. Cabill, Charles Bishop, for allowing me the choice, the opportunity to share my opinion, because this will be interesting to see how this shapes up from the SID perspective, but from your personal fans perspective as well, because we have a lot more stake in some of the individual teams than others. So I think you'll have a bunch of different rankings as you, as you get into the season. So, and mine, I, mine is no different. So. No doubt about it. This is Dr. Ville inside the HBC Sports Lab. Mike will be jumping off, but we'll give you the last uh, five or so minutes in our segment. Let me go to Charles. I know you had, different frameworks uh, as we kind of spill over from the last uh, dialogue about FAMU, uh, Ryan Stanley is not back. Obviously they had the big name Kansas State transfer coming in, but there's some questioning whether he's actually back on campus or been on campus. Those questions uh, have some other quarterbacks in the fold as well, though they were pretty talented. It'd be fascinating to see what that looks like. Obviously all the transfers that are coming in at Jackson State, you got a whole nother team that you're really looking at. I believe uh, the pregame show had with Neely had a great interview with um, Coach Prime in regards to only having two starters that are dedicated. So a lot of people will really go in the camp pushing uh, to make sure that they get their time on the field, especially as a starter in a lot of ways. So what were you going to get into when you were measuring your thoughts in terms of that Alabama a and M fam, you one two perspective that you saw there. Well, I, I think that's the big thing that you take a look at in terms of uh, the roster training that's happened uh, uh, through the spring with the transfer portal and uh, all the way up until now. When you take a look at uh, who is going to fill the shoes of Ryan Stanley, the last time we saw Florida a and uh, on the field, you know uh, he was uh, leading them to 
that quote unquote black college national championship. So, you know, what are the pieces that are coming back for fam? Uh, we know uh, uh, Alabama a and is, is a known quantity in terms of the receivers on the quill glass. So I, I think some of those things factor in. I'm going to piggyback on what Mike was saying. I think Jackson State will, uh, from the SID perspective, will be ranked a little bit lower based on their performance in the spring. But we're going to be taking a look at a completely different roster. Uh, I think, um, like you said, Coach Prime mentioned it on the pregame show, that uh, right now, you know, he sees only two stars. So it's going to be a tremendous amount of competition once you get to fall practice uh, for playing time. And, you know, there could be some surprises. People who you saw on the field in the spring might not be there uh, uh, it's starting in the fall. So I think those Bingo. are things that kind of factor in with regards to Jackson State. I think they are such an X factor, such an unknown quantity because there has been so much roster uh, turnover with Jackson State. So, but, you know, you take a look at it, uh, and I, I kind of went through just the amount of talent that was in the league. Uh, you had 12 guys that were playing uh, in the spring uh, that have transferred to FBS programs. And I think that kind of changes the landscape, if you will, of each of these teams. I mean, when you start uh, taking a look at a, a guy like Marcus Cushing, uh, played in the SWAC championship game, and now he's at Florida State. Uh, when you take a look at Michael Jefferson, uh, Alabama State's uh, former deep threat, now he's at Louisiana Lafayette. Uh, Quinterio Cole, uh, who really anchored that Alcorn uh, secondary. Now he's moved on to Louisville. So you have a lot of uh, factors, I think, that have really changed the dynamics of the roster. So that's another part of the excitement. There's so much uh, roster change uh, that you really don't have a, a real good fix on what all these teams are bringing to media day. So I think that's part of the fun. I'm looking forward to uh, really getting more insight on all of these teams in terms of Coaches really kind of framing that roster in terms of, although we lost this, this is, this is what we added. So I think that's part of the intrigue uh, going into this media day. Yeah, and that's and he did a very good job if you look, to explain what I was trying to get on. You have so many moving pieces. Great job with breaking that down, CB. What we thought we saw in the spring is not what we have here. And when the SIDs look at it, they're going to look at past performances, past records. But I think the fans that are closer, they know the, all of these moving pieces. So you're going to have a bunch of different rankings. Thanks for uh, kind of eloqu <laughs> eloquently saying what I couldn't get out, CB. <laughs> Let me jump in here before we jump off uh, and conclude the show. Lonnie Shaw, y'all underestimate BC, but just wait. Again, this is the SID's perspective, not ours. We'll see what they say. Um, he gave a little chime in. He said PV beats Grambling in the State Fair Classic, and the rest of this season is a flop. Ooh, that one yep. hurts for family fans out there. UAP's loss of players uh, as well. Yeah, a lot of players that were lost, and I think, um, as you both just said, it'll be fascinating because the talent that is churning per, per team is going to be fascinating. It's something that we will have to grapple with as we do our predicted order of finishes and how we see things play out week to week based on what we see with our eyes and do a readjustment of the analytics. I think that is fascinating because you have people that have proven it on the field that have transferred out to FBS, but you have a lot of FBS players transferring in Right. It proved it within the SWAC. Some of them come in highly ranked, either coming out of high school. Some of them pretty highly ranked coming in as graduate transfers. They want to see a different destinations that have got it done. But how will those teams jail? Then you have those underclassmen that are turning a year older. What have they done in the weight room? How much focus and how much those are things that you can't necessarily put your finger on because um, we're not there in the moment. We've heard different things. But how were the coaches able to navigate this space with these guys um, being able to get their body ready? How much of an influence will any injuries take place? We didn't see a lot of them really in the spring. But what will that do in terms of them getting their bodies rehabilitated and ready to go? And the last one I will look at in regards to uh, those frameworks about just the junior college transfers that churn and come in as well. It'll be fascinating to see what that happens. We have some coaching changes out there uh, in terms of one case at the head coaching position. And then you had a lot of the assistants that do not necessarily get as much of the noise. That will be fascinating as well. So uh, kudos to both of you all in terms of breaking that down, which will give us a chance to really 
give you some ideas when we do do our predicted order finish, what we're thinking about in that framework. And with that, shout out to J Mac as well. Ralph Cooper is checking us out, Jerome Sutton. And for all those that normally jump in here and check us out, just want to say thanks for joining us on this Sunday edition. You'll see more of this do out during the fall or throughout the fall, I should say. So thank you for listening to Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Kenyatta Kabil, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from inside the College of HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. I want to say thanks to our guest, Dr. Jason Capel, a SWAC Associate Commissioner, giving us some insight on the COVID-19 protocol and how they are making moves to make sure that um, everybody is safe as possible, letting the science dictate what direction they will go. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Lewis Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Watson and Charles Bishop every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock. We'll look forward to next week as we discuss the latest news in the lab. Look for some special things coming out um, this week as we get into Birmingham. This should be fascinating. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Bill, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Follow Charles Bishop on Twitter as well and Instagram. Give that plug real quick, Charles. Oh, no doubt. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at cbishop1906 and at Twitter as well. Uh, and you can also catch me on the pregame show. So we'll be uh, going uh, live from uh, Birmingham as well. So, uh, Mike, give your plugs in terms of social media platforms in the 1876s coming back in maybe uh, a streaming platform as well. That's right. Absolutely. <clears throat> Don't forget to catch 1876 Sports, Sports and Culture podcast coming to a podcast and streaming location very soon. You can catch me at, at MikeWash88 on uh, in, Instagram. I'm sorry, I'm on Twitter. And on Instagram, you can MikeWash underscore the ace. Nice, the ace. Y'all know what that is. <laughs> Inside the HBC Sports Lab 1 on Twitter. Facebook is HBC Sports Lab, as well as YouTube. Subscribe, like, do all those things. Tell your friends. Dream big and continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Mike? Of course. Charles? Lecture? Dismiss? YT Productions. <laughs>